Okay, and we're live. So welcome everyone. I'm very, very glad to, to be moderating our, my first uh, webinar during the actual bird watching event. We've had a, a few of these before, uh, but this is the first one I've been able to, to attend. And since, since we've actually been uh, arrived at Sagres and started the bird watching festival here in Sagres, and this one holds a very special place in my heart. Uh, Jackie as was my first real boss, let's say, and uh, in the conservation world. And uh, with her, I've lived the, probably the hardest and happiest days of, uh, well, months of, of my life. Um, she, she, she ran for many years um, this, this project, SOS Turtles. Um, and uh, made a real difference, a, grasp, a graspable difference for the lives of thousands, probably more turtles in the world. And she obviously, she, she reached a lot of people uh, and that is also extremely valuable. Um, just a quick note for how this webinar will work. So if you have any questions along the, along the, the activity, you can place them on the chat and Jackie will address them in the end. So feel free to pose any questions that you you want you want you want to, uh, and we'll discuss discuss them in the end. So Jackie, I'm gonna send this over to you. It's your audience. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. Thanks, Andre. Thanks for that really lovely um, introduction. That's great. I just like to say thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to do this it's also the first webinar that i've ever done first time i've ever made a presentation without a live audience so it's really interesting um so i've titled my presentation battle for the beaches why because most people think that turtle conservation is, is just this lovely thing where you're just walking on the beach at night and you know just checking out a few turtles maybe taking some data and stuff but in actual fact um, it is a very tough world to be in. It's very hard work. You're often fighting against so many different elements as I'm going to show you in my presentation. But first, just a little bit of information about me. Um, I'm a filmmaker. It's something that I always dreamed of. Um, and I always wanted to be uh, a diver as well, and I qualified to dive as soon as I was a junior, and I was lucky enough to be able to come back. Um, this is me in that horrendous suit, and we dived, I dived that in Venice Lagoon, extremely murky water. Um, very interesting experience, and it's on YouTube if you want to see it. Truth about killer squid is about Humboldt squid, um, a really enormous squid that you can see in the photograph. They're actually much bigger than me. And uh, they have this fearsome reputation, but we set out to see if they really were man eaters or not. Um, an animal that you need to be a little bit cautious about because they really do want to eat everything that's in their path. And they have a lot of teeth in those um, sucker discs, as you can see. And um, the other one that I'm going to mention is uh, Grey Seals. This was a film that we made in um, Dingle on the west coast of Ireland. And we discovered that there were um, 60 seals killed by fishermen because the seals were taking our fish. Um, and that you can see on Amazon Prime at the moment. So uh, that film was really amazing because there and uh, seals and um, we actually came across some twin seals and twins in a grey seal is quite unusual so the whole film was about them um, and they did both go off to sea in the end. So I mentioned in this film that there was a leatherback turtle that was caught up in a fishing net and this turtle was taken to Dingle Aquarium and um, researchers from Swansea University back to her just to see where she was going to go. So we were a little bit involved in that and we filmed her going back into the sea. And this kind of really got me thinking, well, where is this turtle going to? And where, uh, what is her journey all about? So with the satellite tagging, we could see that she left Dingle and she traveled down in the end to French Guiana. But on the way, she passed this place called Cape Bird. Cape Bird, I'd vaguely heard of it, but I didn't really know very much about it. And when I started doing some research on it, I found it 
to be really fascinating. There's a long history of migration. Um, this is actually Darwin's trip down to um, the Galapagos. And on his way, you can see that he passed Cape Verde. And Cape Verde is in many ways like the Galapagos because it was uninhabited. It's 450 kilometers off the coast. And at the time, it had a lot of endemic species. The other group that frequented Cape Verde was unfortunately the slave trade. It was a big stopping off point for them. And pirates. So Francis Drake had even been there and the infamous Captain Kidd. And there are many stories about treasure, still buried treasure being um, on Maya, but that, to my knowledge, I don't think anyone's found it. And then finally, which was one of the most interesting things for me, was about uh, the humpback whales. So the humpback whales we were seeing off the West Coast were coming down to Cape Verde and they were actually breeding and giving birth there and then coming all the way back up. So I thought, well, this is, could be a really interesting place to go and make a film. So I managed to waggle myself a little trip with um, writing a, um, an article for a dive magazine. And we, we visited six islands and absolutely fell in love with the place. So then we moved there and we realized that the loggerhead turtle population was extremely important. In fact, the third most important nesting site in the world after Florida and Oman. We didn't actually realize that before we went there. So I was there with Neil, my partner, and we just started walking on the beaches, recording the tracks that we saw. We didn't know anything about uh, what was the correct data to take or anything like that, but just making notes of the nests and, um, and just thinking, well, it could be useful to someone researching for our film. I'll show you this picture of a loggerhead turtle nest. And for me, this is just the most perfect and most beautiful nest. And I wonder if anybody actually knows where the eggs might be, maybe somewhere around here, maybe you think back there. So I'll just describe it a little bit to you. This is where she walks in, she's coming in here. And you can see that this track goes under this track. So that's definitely the, uh, the in track. And just before she starts doing this, uh, covering all of this up, you can see that she's stopped there. So the eggs are going to be around there somewhere. Once she's finished putting the eggs in, she starts walking and throwing the sand back with her front flippers, which let me tell you, if you're in the way of that, you're gonna know about it. She comes all the way around here. She finishes her cover up or her camouflage and she starts walking out and back um, to the sea, hopefully. So this is what I wanted to be doing. Um, I really thought that we would just be walking on the beach at night and that we're taking a lot of nice photographs and filming a lot and making a story out of that. But unfortunately, this is what we were seeing. Hundreds and hundreds of dead turtles. And nobody cared. There was nobody, nobody was saying to us, oh yes, Jackie, it's terrible. We should do something about it. But um, they were just like, well, you know, that's the way it is. But there was one day where we went to the beach in the morning and in a one kilometre of beach, we found 13 dead looking. I'm just gonna mention there's maybe about four slides that are quite graphic. So if you don't want to see those, just look away now. Um, so these turtles, they'd just kill them, take the meat and discard their bodies wherever even just throwing them in the trash. This is in the middle of uh, Santa Maria, which is the main tourist area, and just nobody cared. I'd just like to uh, point out that this is not subsistence fishing or anything like that. There's plenty of fish that can be caught very um, easily and also bought on the pier very cheaply. And people did not need the turtle meat to survive. For the most part, on South, people were, buying, uh, were killing turtles and selling the meat, 400 one adult turtle, in order to fund drug use or alcoholism and that sort of thing, or as a habit for um, festivals or, and all of those kind of things. So it was even so blatant that people was on the street. So we were pretty horrified with this. And talking to some researchers from Natura uh, Doshnil, who had a research project on Boa Vista, 
And they told us that they originally came to Sal and they started doing some data collection, but they realized that it wasn't, there wasn't any point because the turtles were going to be extinct in 2015. So that was eight years after we arrived in Sal and they had no hope at all left for these turtles. Yeah. So um, how the turtles are killed, um, I want to talk about that because uh, it adds to my motivation how strongly that we felt that we had to do something. So they get a hold of the turtle and they drag her out of the water or they take her as she's nesting, turn her upside down because the turtle is fairly uh, immobile when she's upside down. And then they cut the flippers off because they don't want the turtles, you know, getting in the way of them um, taking the meat from her. The next uh, part is really graphic, so please look away if you feel a bit sensitive. Um, so here is a turtle that is still alive, um, and we caught the, the hunters. This is later in the project. We caught them in the act. So they cut the flippers off, and then they tried to cut. Uh, they cut through the plastron, which is the hard bit on the front of the turtle. And of course, there was nothing we could do for this turtle. We had to euthanize her. This, is, this was a pivotal moment for us because um, Neil and I with some other people, we were walking on the beach at night, hoping to see a turtle nesting. And we heard some men a little bit further back. And when we went towards them, they ran off and we realized that they had just killed this turtle. And this turtle's heart was still beating. And the brutality of that was just, just completely overwhelming. And we felt really depressed about it, but fortunately, we decided to continue our vigil that night and we did see a live turtle and she nested and she went back into the sea. So this is the first beautiful loggerhead turtle that we saw on Sal and she's really, she really means a lot to us. So um, a few nights later, we were walking on the beach, a different beach, and it was a beach that we could eat, reach really easily from where we were living. And we came across these two gentlemen. Now they tried to convince us that they work for the Cameron Municipal or the City Hall, and their job was to protect the turtles. Well, of course, we were a little bit dubious, but okay, they said that. So we stayed on the beach, just kind of keeping an eye on them. But at about two o'clock in the morning, we thought, well, we really have to go. Um, but we saw them down by the water's edge, and we saw, tried to see what they were doing, and then suddenly we was, oh my God, they've got a turtle. So we ran towards them, and they immediately left the turtle and ran away, but not before Neil could get a photograph of one of them. Um, so while he was doing that, the other one came back, so we took his photograph as well. And we went the next day with these photographs and to the police, and the police were really interested. And these two things gave us some hope that we could do something. One, that there was some support from the community for us to try and stop this. And two, that the hunters that we had encountered were really not interested in, in harming us, as people have said, they just would run away because they don't want to be caught. And so many people had said to us, other Europeans on South said, you must never go to the beach at night because there's people there with knives and they're going to kill you. But that was patently not true. And I really think that this myth grew up so much over the years that everybody was just like, well, we can't do anything. That's just the way it is. So, um, where, did we, where were we going to start? We, we wanted to save these beautiful turtles, but we had no idea how to go about it. But fortunately, some friends started talking to me about um, a guy called uh, Juan Blanco, who was the manager of Scuba Carib, which is the dive center at the Rio Hotel, which at that time was the biggest hotel on the island. And he was also interested in this issue. And him and his team used to go out in the mornings um, along the beach nearest to them and see if they could get any eggs to bring back to save or to see if they could record any tracks. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the eggs that they found were from turtles that had already been killed. But nevertheless, they collected them and brought them back to their hatchery. And those, those eggs that you see on the top right are actually eggs from a, a uh, turtle who was killed. So they've been out of her body and out on, in the sun for a while. But miraculously, a lot of them actually hatched. So it was an amazing initiative. So from this, Juan and I started this uh, non-profit NGO called SOS Tartarugas. And, um, and that was our started. But we're never going to be able to do anything much without some funding. So that was the next important step. 
So I started writing grant proposals and all sorts of things. But at the time on Sal, this was a really, really common sight. It was everywhere. Every restaurant and bar you went into, there were people who had these turtles, these poor hatchlings going round and round in circles in a water bottle on top of a bar. And most of the time they're just floating there. You can see that turtle on the, on the left. He's just got his flippers sitting up and he's just not interested in anything. A lot of the time, the people would take the turtles and they would keep them because they believed that they were helping them by getting them to be bigger and stronger. And then they put them in the sea after a year and take a new turtle. Well, of course, that isn't the right thing to do because the turtles really need that initial burst of energy after they come out of the nest. And by keeping them like this, they were really losing that. Um, this is the airport in Boa Vista when it opened the new airport and um, I was absolutely horrified to go there and see that even they had captive loggerhead turtles. So it was just so completely widespread. This is a restaurant in Asparagus, which is the capital of Sal, and they put some juvenile green turtles in there and a moray eel. And why they're there, nobody knows. I mean, not, they didn't intend to eat them. It's just an attraction, but who thinks that that is... And there, were, and, um, there were plenty of places where you could go and you could pay euro and they would show a turtle of all shapes and sizes, all sorts of different species. Um, sorry everyone for the bad connection. We're using a mobile uh, internet and sometimes it, it kind of goes off. I think we have Jackie back and we'll resume in a second. see myself now. Yep. Okay. So, uh, sorry about that, guys. Okay. So um, I was just saying that uh, it was at one of these places. I can't do anything. Oh, there. Um, you can see that this turtle in, in, in really bad condition. Um, a lot of And all sorts of things. Is that a guy who was on holiday with some of his colleagues?
and we're back, I think. I'll be back. Yeah. Yeah. I just close it. Okay, sorry guys. I'm start again in just a second. Just don't. Uh, Go. Okay. Yep. So, sorry about the connection again, guys. I hope you're sticking with us. So, um, as I was saying, uh, the guy took all of the turtles and put them in the sea, and the owner of the restaurant started getting very aggressive and called the police. So, he was actually arrested, taken to the jail, and charged with theft. Well, of course, that wasn't really going to stick. Uh, you know, he had a good lawyer and he got out. And afterwards, he was talking to some mutual friends about in, in what you're doing. So I went to see him and talked to him and made a presentation about uh, our project and what we had in mind. Now, remember, I didn't know anything about turtles. I've never been on a turtle conservation project. So it was all just this idea that I had that if we put enough volunteers on the beach, we would start to deter hunters and we could grow from there and do other things as well. And he was really keen um, and he actually, uh, actually fully funded us for that first year and then helped us for the second year as well. And he kept in close contact with the project and this is him with his family uh, when he came back to visit us, I think in 2015 or 14. And um, such a great guy, he's on the, um, the right, um, he's even helping us to get more subscribers and adoptions in the hatchery. And that's us together the last time we saw each other. And while we were talking, I had a presentation in front of me like uh, this, talking to him, and there was a television screen behind my head. And he said to me, do you know what, Jackie, more people need to be like you. Get out there and do things and not just watch tele uh, football on television. Well, I had to laugh because, uh, in fact, I am really a big football fan. I do watch a lot of football on television. So we agreed that maybe it's possible to do both. So there's also a happy ending for the turtles in that place that are shown in Fontona because um, the guy, after a lot of negotiation, agreed that we should release all of the turtles. And he actually became a monitor for our project and he was taking care of the beaches close to where he lived. So that was really great. We had, at that time, we had a general amnesty for anybody who had turtles in their home, just bring them, no questions asked. And we had hundreds of turtles that were given to us, all sorts of sizes. This is a one-year-old loggerhead hatching, but we also had um, fully grown loggerheads that are generally would be kept in people's houses, upside down, possibly for months, just waiting for the right moment where they were going to kill them and eat them. But that's okay, we've got them back. We had green turtles, we had hawks bills, all sorts. It was quite incredible. I don't know where the people kept them all. So just before we move on, oh yes, yes, sorry, that was another one that was uh, released. Just before we move on to our actual project, I just want to touch a little bit on turtles and their biology. In Cabo Verde, we have five different species of turtles, but only one of them, the loggerhead, nests, or so we thought. Because in 2013, we also had some green turtles nesting, and that has carried on now um, and I believe there's been some more this year. So um, this is a green turtle hatchling and I think that they are the absolute prettiest hatchlings out of all of them. You might may or may not agree. I'm going to show you a loggerhead hatchling. Well, what do you think? Personally, I think that the, um, the green is much prettier. You may comment, vote for your favorite hatchling. 
So how does it work? Well, they start to arrive April and May and they're swimming around uh, the shores of Cape Verde and then they're mating. Um, they never, the males never come ashore. Once they've left as hatchlings, they will never uh, come ashore on the, um, again. So all the mating is done out at sea. And then the females start to come ashore June to October. Um, and they're laying in Cape Verde, probably well on Sal in during our project, the, the most nests that we ever recorded for one female was five. So between one and seven nests each season. And they come every two to three years and they spend the period in between when they're not with us off Western Africa. This is a very famous turtle on our project called Batismo. And she had um, one flipper missing. Uh, I think it was her right back flipper. And so she had a very distinctive track. And this turtle was quite astonishing because she came to the same exact spot every time she wanted to lay a nest. And each time she came back. So um, over the course of six years, she would arrive at exactly the same spot. Now, most people think that that's what all turtles do, that they go directly back to the beach where they originally were born. But it's not really the case. It's more like the region, especially on Sal, we would have turtles that we used to joke. They would nest with us once, and then uh, a few weeks later, they would go for a little holiday to Boa Vista, and then they'd come back to us. Boa Vista is another island in Cabo Verde, in case you don't know. So it does vary a lot. Um, the hatchlings are born, and when they are born, they go into the sea and they have this uh, swimming frenzy that gets them out past the surf area. And then they're just drifting on the currents. Um, and our turtles will drift up to the north, so around the Azores, Mediterranean, that sort of way. And they're called the lost years because we don't really know what's going on with them too much. And 25 years or so later, they'll return to breed and start the whole thing all over again. So in terms of that adult turtles that were nesting on Cape Verde, this is a satellite tagging project. So we can track where they've gone and you can see that this, uh, they're going over to this area mostly and that's where they're feeding and they're building up on their reserves ready for the next migration back to the islands to um, nest again. So this is um, Senegal and Gambia and I think Guinea-Bissau. So when we talk in terms of them being our turtles as in Cabo Verdean turtles, they're really not. They're actually uh, spend a lot of their time off the coast of Western Africa. So this is why we need to have joined up conservation programs. We need to work in conjunction with um, the fishing fleets over here and the people as well to protect them. Um, I just wanted to include this nice story about this turtle called Terry. She was um, a loggerhead and she was found uh, in Jersey, which is in the um, channel between UK and France. And she was uh, really sick and they needed to fly her to a rehab center in Gran Canaria, um, which as you can see, they raised 10,000 pounds and she, was, went, she went on a private jet owned by Iron Maiden Frontman, very interesting. But the main thing is, if you look in the bottom down here, you see just how far she traveled and this is in 287 days, so less than one year, 8,500 kilometers. It's really quite astonishing. So we've got our funding in place. We've got our idea that we're just going to have volunteers and um, we start to get our team. Now I had a kind of different idea because I'd never been on a turtle conservation project, but it seemed to me that there were a lot of um, biologists and other people who had graduated, maybe even got a master's degree, and they could not get a job. They just kept going from volunteering to volunteering to volunteering. So I tried to set up the project so that everybody got paid. It wasn't a massive amount, but they got paid enough to, um, to buy food and we provided accommodation and everything else. So this is our team for 2008. It's uh, very small, as you can see. And um, I even co-opted my niece here to join in as well. I think she's watching. And um, it was mostly some um, uh, European women and mostly Cape Verdean men as well. One Portuguese guy as well. And that's Neil over there. Okay, 
So the first job we did was to go around the entire island and we picked up every bit of dead turtle shell that we could find. Why did we do this? Because we wanted to start from a base of zero so we would know exactly how many turtles had been killed um, in our first year in 2008. That was one of the most depressing jobs I've ever done in my life and we collected so many. I wanted to take them to the town square of Santa Maria and just put them there to show the people what was going on. But uh, my colleague there who works for the Cameroon Municipal, the person responsible for the environment, he was just, I think, just embarrassed by it and he didn't want to do that. So we burned them all. Of course, when you set up a conservation project, you can't just do it in isolation. So we had to form partnerships with many different people. And so when you say partners, you think, well, okay, everyone's going hand in hand and, and it's, there's all the same objectives and everything's gonna be okay. But the problem is that it's not always like that. So that's another battle. So when I say battle, for the beaches, we're talking about um, organizing what's going on. But nevertheless, we have to work hard to get everyone working together with that. And then we got started and we realized, of course, it's not just about the hunters. There's a lot of um, other problems as well. So, for example, this is uh, sand mining, people just helping themselves to sand on the beach and causing massive erosion and making the beaches really hard and rocky and unsuitable for nesting. And then um, just completely unregulated tourism with everybody just deciding to, you know, take tours on the beach and nobody really caring. There was already a law in place that you weren't allowed to do this, but nobody ever enforced it. And this is the sad result of what happens if you, um, if you drive on the beaches when there's hatchings around. So we started putting up these signs and trying to persuade people nicely that really you shouldn't be driving on the beach. And you can see here that we've got this nice barrier. There's an official sign, there's our little sign, but everyone's just like, yeah, no, I'm not paying any attention to that. There was so much resistance to this idea, especially from a lot of Europeans who were used to driving their quads all over and just thought they were in the Wild West where no laws applied to anybody. And um, I had a lot of uh, um, trouble with people uh, insisting that I had made this law, particularly I had made it. Well, I would love that. Wouldn't it be great to be so powerful? But that wasn't the case. It was just the case that we were trying to publicize this and get people to be more aware. Marine pollution, massive, massive problem, of course. Um, hatchings being caught in fishing nets. Uh, this poor turtle, she's lost a flipper. We weren't able to save her. Uh, she'd been caught in a net and it just completely ripped her flipper off. Um, and again, fishing is a really big problem for marine turtles. Um, these, it's, there's two turtles caught in this net. You won't believe it, but these turtles were mating. And uh, the male was extremely upset to have this, uh, this activity stopped and was trying to bite anyone. In fact, several people got a little nip. Um, but uh, that just shows you how strong their mating instinct is. And this poor girl, this is only half of what was attached to her when we managed to get a hold of her. Um, she did survive eventually, she was all right, but you can see that she's been like this for a long time. She's got a lot of growth on her shell. And hatchlings as they're coming out of the nest. Um, these also were alive still, so that's really great. The beach cleans. From the minute that we stepped foot on Sal, we were over there cleaning that beach day after day, picking off bits, and we had so many beach cleans. It was just, you know, I really think now it's much, much better because this, the rubbish is not buried as deep in the sand, but it's an ongoing problem. And a lot of this stuff is drifting across from um, the west coast of Africa. When we went and visited there in Senegal, we could see. The, the stuff that they were using was exactly the stuff that was uh, drifting up onto our beaches on sand. Okay, I'm um, sorry, I'm just gonna have a quick drink. And lights. This is just part of Santa Maria, right beside the beach, and this was completely normal. We had some really nice campaigns where we managed to persuade people to put red lights, uh, put kind of filters on all of these lights. It's not complicated to have turtle friendly lighting. It's just a matter of motivation. And there was this weird anomaly in the law 
where you could do your environmental assessment uh, and have all of your project plan approved for your hotel, your apartment block, or whatever. And then you could put a beach bar right there and not necessarily have any environmental assessment. So this is what was going on. Lights, in case you don't know, are a huge problem for both the adults and the hatchlings. On this side, you can see this is a perfectly hatched nest. It's something that you don't see very often. You can see all of the tracks are going directly into the sea. And the turtles are heading for um, the brightest part on the beach, which is the surf breaking on And on the other side, you can see that the hatchings have come kilometer away from the beach and they're trying to get to the bright spot. And this hatchling here has just kept going and going and going through here, heading for these construction lights. This is during a, the construction phase on the west coast of Sal. And uh, the hatchlings are headed towards the town over here and fallen into this pit of death. And fortunately, we have some really robust rangers. And this is Helen deciding to go and find a ladder and take all these poor hatchlings out and get them back into the sea. Some of them were not in very good condition at all. Um, open ditches and drainage and all of this was just a really common thing there. And um, construction at night. This is Tortuga Beach deciding that they're just um, in the middle of the nesting season, they're gonna put up beach umbrellas and they're not gonna do it during the day. They're actually gonna do it at night because otherwise, uh, their guests might get a bit of sand in their face. Disorientating also for the adult turtles. Um, this turtle has come out to a place where she would normally nest. In fact, it's very close to the place that I showed you where we saw our first turtle. And she has come up against this big barrier and has tried really hard to dig a nest here, but just given up. Now she might come out later that night, she might come out tomorrow, or she might just dump her eggs at sea. So it's really important that we don't create all these barriers. And we fought for a long time to have this uh, move back or taken down. So what was our work? Well, it was mainly walking on the beaches at night and making sure that every turtle that we saw got back into the water. There was a hard and fast rule that no, you never leave a turtle, never ever. Even if it's going over your shift, you never leave her. We were also um, collecting data and doing some research. Um, and the lady over here is a lady called Britannia, who's a very experienced turtle um, biologist. And we got her to come over and show us the, um, the basic data that we needed to take in, um, in order to uh, give our projects some credibility and to learn more about the turtles and what we needed to do. I'd just like to mention that you all probably know that if you're ever on a turtle nesting beach, you don't use any kind of lighting or flash photography. These photos are, were taken just so we could um, show them for training to make people understand what we needed to do. Um, okay, so this is the aim. It's a beautiful sight, I think you'll agree. And I always go to see turtles, and every range in the world has a thrill with them, seeing the turtles and not mind getting a bit wet. So, um, this is a turtle that also we were able to save. She's been stabbed in the neck about 11 times. I'm showing you this to show you just. Actually, it's really quite hard to kill a turtle. And you may have heard that from um, days before, pirates and so on, and uh, people in sh uh, ships, they would keep the turtles for a long time. So they can stay on their backs for many months without food or water. And this turtle, um, they uh, didn't really succeed in hurting her at all. And with a bit of antiseptic and so on, she was back happily going back into the sea um, there. So we became, almost like detectives. And for those of you who, who don't know, this is a drag mark. You remember that I told you that they would flip the turtles on their back and then um, uh, start killing them there. Well, things started changing a lot because they would uh, not kill them directly on the beach as they had for so many years, but actually drag them. You can see this is dragging on and on and on for quite a long way. 
And that was a really good sign for us because it was getting harder for them to actually um, have the peace and quiet to kill the turtles. And that, that gave us more time to actually find them before it was too late. So this is a, this is a turtle that we, we could see that the track was coming out and the length that they would go to to disguise it would be cutting this fence away and dragging her all the way up here. Um, unfortunately, it was too late. They attempted to hide her, but it's pretty easy to find the turtles uh, like that. Um, and then also they started burying turtles in order to come back to them later when maybe we weren't around. Well, this turtle, um, they just don't stay still. They're going to fight and fight. They're very resilient and they flap a lot around like this and they start to be able to get themselves out of the sand. And um, when we were looking for her, we found the end of the, the drag mark and then there was nothing, just footprints. But you stop and you listen and you think, what's that noise? And it's actually, when they're flapping, they're actually hitting themselves in the chest. So you hear that and we actually found her. Now that's uh, myself and another ranger turning a turtle uh, back uh, the right way around. These turtles are more than a metre, 150 kilos. It's quite a job to turn them over. And then when you do turn them over, are they going to go the right way? No, they're not going to go the right way. They go all sorts of ways. They get really disorientated in the daylight and they stuff. So you're continually turning her, trying to get her to go the right way. Or if you're big and strong, you can pick her up and take her back to the sea. And they enjoy a little ride like this. If you're even bigger and they're stronger, you can do it by yourself. Now, we actually do employ uh, quite a few um, supermen here who could just lift a turtle and carry her into the sea, but there were um, not very many of those. Um, and they got themselves into all sorts of situations. It wasn't just uh, that the, the hunters were dragging them up off the beach, they were actually getting lost. And this one managed to wedge herself um, into some rocks here. Fortunately, we found her. And um, this is why they call them uh, Tortuga boba in um, Spain, in Spanish, so that means actually silly turtle, which they are really silly turtles. Uh, sometimes they come up and nest in the most inappropriate place. The nest is right there, so she's actually crawled under these beach chairs and laid a nest there, which isn't really the best place to be. Um, and of course the hotel is responsible for removing the beach furniture at night, but that often doesn't happen either. And uh, here's one coming out of the sea. She decided that 12 o'clock on a very, very hot day and so with these turtles sometimes. This is a turtle who's uh, quite special to me. Um, she's called uh, Kansada. And uh, she was one of the first uh, turtles that we were scrambled for because Neil and I would go to bed, um, but we would have the phone. And as soon as there was any hint of any trouble or any turtle or any, uh, any turtle missing or any... Uh, unknown people on the beach, we would be the first person that they called. So we'd get up, we'd get this big searchlight, we'd come out with the quad, we'd race all over the beaches, trying to locate the turtle, locate the hunters, locate, calling, getting the police, coordinating them as well. It was like really full of adrenaline. And this turtle, I know she looks like she's a bit hurt, but she's not, she's fine. We eventually found her, but she had been uh, taken so far back, there was just no way that she was gonna walk back to the sea. So this lucky turtle, got a ride on a quad. I bet that's something to talk about. And she came back and I saw her again uh, several times that season and then a few years later as well. And it's so thrilling when you actually see that same turtle that survived all the things they have to go through and come back. And how do we know it's the same turtle? Because we're using two methods of identifying them. One, a metal tag in the flipper. Um, and another one, which is like a microchip that goes into their shoulder so we can scan them. And the other thing that we decided to do was to give them all names. And this wasn't just because, you know, we're a bit soppy or anything. We really thought that if we named all these turtles, they become almost more real to people. So when we make stories in the news about, uh, you know, tag number YYY726 was killed at Sierra Negra, it doesn't have much impact. But when we say, Shelley and we tell her story it starts to have more resonance with people and we really found this to be an effective thing to do. Um, this is uh, all the rangers had to um, write what they got up to that night 
And this is one of the entries that really made me laugh a lot. You can see just how crazy it is. You're walking maybe 16 kilometers on really soft sand. You're looking all the time for turtles. You're looking all the time for hunters. Your adrenaline is up all the time. It's nonstop. So on this particular night, they, they found several tracks, several nests, some very dodgy looking men and a donkey, because of course you expect to see a donkey on the beach at night, don't you? Well, we think that the donkey was there in order to get the turtle and take her away. So that, that was interesting. And some years later, I found um, a little um, pottery thing on Boa Vista and it was a donkey with a turtle on the top. So it seemed like that was the way that they used to do it in the old days. How are we getting on? Well, at the end of 2008, um, we had a 72% reduction of mortality, and that was an estimate based on how many um, uh, shells had been recorded the previous year. So you would say at this stage that we're winning the battle of the beaches. We had 376 nests, which let me tell you, to a team so small as ours, it seemed like a, a lot, but we had no idea what was coming next. So things were going pretty well. We had our hatchery um, and the hatchery was uh, there because we needed to move nests. The primary reason being the lights. You can see here that uh, any nest that was um, in a place where... And the second biggest reason was because a lot of these turtles would lay their nests below the watermark. So a nest can stand being washed over you know, maybe once or twice in its life, but if it's constantly getting back and forth twice a day, it's not going to survive. So we would move it for that reason. And the hatching success in the hatchery is how we know whether it's okay what we're doing. And you can see that these are all the, um, some of the different beaches on South, and this is the hatchery. And the percentage, this is the percentage of turtles that are born live is right up there as well. And all of these percentages are really quite good for loggerhead nests. But the difference with the hatcheries, every single turtle that's born in the hatchery is going into the sea and has a chance. And you may already know that it's only one in 1,000 hatchlings actually survive. So the more hatchlings that we can get into the sea, the better their chance of survival is. So that's what we're aiming for. Lots of hatchlings being born and into the sea. We had some strange things at the um, born in the hatchery. This is, uh, I don't know how to do Photoshop, so it's definitely 100% genuine. We had a, a two-headed turtle being born. Um, he, she, they were alive, but unfortunately they couldn't swim at all. They could walk okay, but they couldn't swim, so um, they weren't able to survive. And also some beautiful albino turtles. Um, they're not true albinos, I don't think. Um, and these are really, really gorgeous, but also have a lower chance of survival because um, they're much more visible at the surface for things like sharks that like to eat them. Also, things we might find in the nest. It might surprise you to know that sometimes there's fish in the nest. When we're um, digging and we're trying to take the eggs out uh, to move them to the hatchery, you suddenly put your hand down and there's this wet, squirmy thing. So what's happening is these fish are remoras. They have suckers and they are on the top of the turtle shell. And as the turtle is coming out of the sea, they don't want to lose their right, so they're clinging on, clinging on. And then when she starts moving around, they just kind of fall into the nest. It's really quite entertaining. It's okay like this, you can just about deal with it. But if you're then um, opening a nest that is hatched and you find this stinking mess inside, it's not so great. Also crabs, the ghost crabs are a big predator of turtle hatchlings. Um, and you'll often find them going in after the eggs as well. So there's been many a time where you put your hand in the nest and, and, and you get a sharp little nip for your troubles. So that's what we were doing, but we knew that as we went on, we had to do more and more. We had to connect with all of these different groups. We had to inspire them. We had to get everybody involved. And some groups were much more um, amenable and open to collaboration than others. Uh, the military were on the beach to support us. They would have little uh, stations and if there was any, any trouble, they would come and help us. So that was really great. Um, mixed, it was kind of mixed from the community. A lot of the, the Europeans weren't really on board with it, but the um, Cap Virgin community started to get more involved in all the activities that we were doing. Businesses, I'm really sorry to say that the vast majority of business, with the exception of the Rio Hotel, where our hatchery was, were really not interested in what was going on, which is really surprising because if we can build Sal to be a major turtle destination, it benefits everybody. 
our biggest supporter by a long way were the tourists who completely understood what we were trying to do and were really, really interested in it. So that was really great. Here's us with uh, the soldiers. We did a lot of military workshops to get them to understand uh, what their role was on the beach and how to go about it. And more and more people from the community started collaborating. We had little projects going on in the outlying villages. This is a village called Pedro de Lume, which is in the northern part of the island. They did a really great job up there. Uh, lots of activities for children, annual turtle parade, visits to the hatchery and so on. Um, and here you can see something very entertaining for the kids. Um, it's very hot and sweaty in that turtle costume. And kids seeing hatchlings for the first time. It's a school activities and activities for young people as well. This is a, um, a youth group that came up and stayed in our camp and went on turtle patrol as well. Uh, we created a, an environmental activity guide that was uh, distributed free of charge to absolutely anybody in the island that wanted them. We printed thousands of them and um, they went to youth groups, to schools, to Cameron municipalities, to anybody really, scout groups, so on and things to draw in the local population. These stickers that you can see here, we had thousands of those. And the idea was to put them everywhere. In fact, we had a competition each year to see who could find the most creative place to put a sticker that wasn't gonna get removed. And it was absolutely thrilling to me when I went, to, I was in Azores uh, last week and I went into this dive center and what do I find there? One of our stickers, it's so great. They've gone around the world. Um, cultural events such as the carnival, we were very active in doing that. And uh, this was a Batuku song that was written especially for us and told about the tale of the turtle and how we had to protect him. And people started bringing us more turtles. This was another turtle that had been kept in someone's house ready for uh, to be eaten. No questions asked, we just take her and put her back in the sea. And there she goes, and you can see she's got some new jewellery as well. Um, and the fishermen started calling us as well. Whenever there was a turtle nesting on the, on the beach, this turtle was called Grace, this gentleman named her Grace. And uh, this is one of the guys that I was telling you about that had a turtle for a long time and used to take it to the sea to give it a bit of a, you know, well, he was, uh, he was seen and he was stopped by the police. And you can see he looks very shamefaced and agreed to give us the turtle and we put it back in the sea. Again, another happy ending to this story because this young boy started working for us and he was a, he was a monitor for some time. So he really, uh, you know, he was really appreciated for his action that day. Uh, people would show up at our house all hours of the day with turtles. This guy walked halfway across the island to bring the turtles to us. Of course, we were trying to get out the message that it didn't need to do that. They just put them in the sea and that's fine, we leave them. But everybody wanted to do something, you know, the right thing. And the right thing seemed to bring them to the turtle lady. Um, and here's another turtle that a fisherman called us about and she's going back into the sea. This for me is a real win because, you know, previously they might just have killed her just because she was there and they were there and there was no deal around a free meal but now people were starting to call us it was really great now this is a funny story because we started to have informants around santa maria it started to get harder to sell the turtle meat to people and so um people would come around and they would start asking you know does anybody want turtle meat and there was a guy called mr banana i kid you not it wasn't a code name my name wasn't mrs orange his name wasn't mr banana and there was mr apple he was called mr banana hey guys mr banana here i see there's two guys walking around the town and if you come quickly you can find them so we would head off and we would be you know like skulking around the corner telling the police waiting for the police and the police i remember this particular incident the police are looking at me and they go is it them and I'm like, oh, Lord. okay yeah it's them um, but there wasn't really that much animosity. In fact, the police brought those guys who were selling the turtle meat to our house later that afternoon, picked Neil up and said, come on, Neil, you're coming with us. So Neil's in the, in the car with these people and it's not like there's any threat. It's kind of like, well, you're doing your thing, we're doing our thing. And then they went up and they, they arrested a lot of people that day because they found a lot of people were involved in, in killing these particular turtles. Other things that we did, um, a big battle, a big campaign against plastic. We were making all these bags uh, locally and we were getting people to give us 
their, their plastic bags and they could have um, a cotton bag instead. Um, and of course, it wouldn't be any project that I was involved on if it didn't include football. So we were coaching the um, kids teams or helping to coach them. And we also created a football tournament where we had um, all sorts of community groups um, come and play football against us. And um, we won, of course, by the way, but that's just by the by. There we go, that's our guys in action. And uh, you know, I don't think this little girl's too impressed by the noise that we're all making. So you remember our team the first year? Well, we're starting to get much bigger. These are the turtle boys. These are the turtle girls. There's my niece again, being silly. Um, as we go on, you can see the teams getting bigger and bigger. The fleet of unreliable vehicles is growing. Bigger there. There's always a couple of dogs involved. And um, you can see that it's really starting to shift. There's a lot more um, convergence involved, which is how it be. With that, though, that brings a, a lot more expense because they need a lot more support than people could be another big expense. And I want to include this photograph because there's someone very special in it on our project looks pretty happy. <laughs> Hope you're laughing, Andre. Um, ambitious about what we could do because I realized that uh, we had resources because we had so much tourism on Sal that we could start to help the other islands who don't have access to that. So there was projects on Sal We can see you, Jackie, just not hear you. Uh, you're still muted and not sharing. <clears throat> So we started gradually going and visiting these islands and seeing what we could do. Um, and uh, at the end of uh, our time there, uh, we had helped uh, people set up their projects on all of these islands. So we would go, we'd do um, uh, knowledge sharing, seminars, all sorts of workshops, help people to learn about um, the field work that they needed to do and uh, provide equipment. Even the simplest things like reliable batteries were really hard to get. It's hard enough on Sal, and it was much harder on them. So essential equipment, like things that you needed to tag the turtles, headlights, you had to have um, red lights on your, in your head torch, really hard to get. So we would send all of these, and any kind of financial assistance that they needed. I'm doing uh, a workshop every year where we would bring um, expenses completely all people to sell and do like a four day workshop of practical activities, classroom work, as you can see there. So you can see that the project is starting to get bigger, the expenses get bigger, but it was always my aim that we had by this time a budget of about 100,000 euros that we had to raise. It was always my aim to get a third of that going to the other islands, so the 40,000. For the most part, the 40,000 came from this amazing fund that's run by the US Fish and Wildlife uh, for, um, it's for endangered animals. And so we would take all of that and we would send it out and distribute it to the other, uh, the other islands and the groups there. Um, so a lot of them are going really strong. We also uh, wanted to have some national activities. So we started uh, doing some um, advocacy. This was something that we created 
uh, in conjunction with a group that was set up called uh, Taola. We look at all the turtle conservation groups um, in Cabo Verde. And a project uh, that was to get uh, restaurants to sign up to say that they don't buy or sell turtle meat. So they would get a sticker, they would sign um, a contract and say that they would never do it and a nice certificate. It wasn't such a big problem on South. It was definitely a big problem in places like Santiago, the, uh, the main island. So how are we going to raise out there that we could apply for? But I really thought that there's other projects that don't have, I mean, in other parts of the world that don't have access to money in the same way that we do with the great support of the tourists. So we started thinking, okay, more tourism activities. So the hatchery started to become a center of activities. And you can see just how popular it is here. Like every afternoon, we're doing a big presentation and sometimes hundreds of people would come to see it. And encouraged people to think about what they could do to help the turtles. And we started selling merchandise um, and as well as, oh, uh, these tea towels, they were one of the most popular things because as all the British people know, you can't go on holiday without buying a nice tea towel. And um, certificates of adoptions, that is obviously just a symbolic adoption and people understood that, um, but it was really, really popular. And even um, the Cameroon Municipal and Sal got involved with, with adopting nests. So that was really great. They got the first nest that year. Um, so yes, each day um, there will be this presentation. There's Neil in full swing, looking very professional. And uh, just take a look at that little girl's face. That's a moment she's never gonna forget. And that's what makes this kind of work so rewarding. You know that well, if she's anything like me, a moment like that is going to send you in the direction of the sea for, um, you know, when she's older, I hope so. And then my dream came true. Like right from the start, I dreamt about having a t an educational centre in the middle of Santa Maria. And I just never thought that would be possible because commercial units are really expensive to rent. But we finally achieved that. And not only did it become a place um, of, uh, to sell our merchandise, but it was somewhere that had a lot of big displays and people could come and learn about turtles. And we did all sorts of events there, like films and that sort of thing. And that for me, that was really, I really felt like we, we were winning there, we were really getting somewhere. We also started doing turtle walks. Uh, we didn't ever intend to do turtle walks, but People used a small, informal way, and then, of course, it got uh, it got much bigger. And the morning walks were just some. And the numbers of the turtles were going up, so we're winning on that. You can see, as I said, 300 as much, and we were just completely overrun, and we didn't know what hit us really, but. Um, almost 20,000 turtles released in that year. It was incredible. I started losing again. So the west coast of Sal. Okay. Okay, you're that. back. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's one big resort now. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, as you can see, there's not really much, too much beach left along here for the turtles, and it's getting worse than that. To give you an idea, this is, is developed by the resort group, which is a British company um, owned by a guy called Rob Jarrett. 
and you can see all the nests marked by these numbers. And um, they were trying to persuade us that uh, in this area, very, very few turtles came up because their data showed that, but actually they didn't have any data and they certainly never asked for any from us. So no, you didn't. You can see what effect it had. And this was really out of construction. And then when they started opening some of the places, I think 2010 was the first one, it drops away. So it's going from about 18% of all nests laid on sal are in front of these two and um, in just a few short years, it's back to, to nothing. So you might say, well, okay, there's a little hockey, there are too many lights, there's, there's, they might be uncontrolled, and so a good situation at all. Um, the contempt that this company showed for any kind of turtle conservation is um, really shown in this photo. This is a, a natural reserve here, and uh, they just throw the sign down. If they want to drive onto it, they're going to drive onto it, and that's that. And, oh, yeah. So, um, uh, Mr. Jarrett would never meet with me. I never found out why. I think that there would be quite a lot of things that we could have done together to improve the situation, and also to give the guests of these resorts a much deeper experience and understanding of the turtles, but that never happened. Um, instead, I was to meet with a, a guy, a local representative called Victor, and Victor told me this great story one day that really showed what they think about turtles and conservation. That he had just come back from Florida, and there while he was in Florida, he visited this beautiful theme park, and at this beautiful theme park, you could see all sorts of things, orcas and dolphins and even turtles. And why didn't I? just get some turtles and build a facility for them and then people wouldn't even have to go to the beach at night they could just see them during the day so what he was asking me to do was to go back in time and go back to places like this and that really is yeah it was really depressing and, and it was a you know it's kind of a big loss but things were going to get unfortunately worse um they put forward this um plan and it was there was an environmental impact assessment and we had the chance to comment on it and supposedly it was a safe swimming area but spontaneously there was someone from the University of Albar who uh, did a study on it and demonstrated that it's far from safe because this narrow opening and it's a model that, that people don't use in breakwaters anymore has the potential to have a big swell here and actually sweep people back out to the sea so making it less safe. The other main issue is that the sand is moving down the beach in this direction, and it's gonna stop there. So it's gonna pile up here, and it's gonna just start um, getting lost here, and this sand will start going back and back. And you can see already the impact that it's had on cell. Um, but nevertheless, um, they got uh, permission to build it, but we were really puzzled. What is this? Why in a safe swimming space, place do you need this little spur here? Well, we thought maybe they're trying to sneak a marina under the radar because they'd already been, everybody had already been told there will never be a marina um, on the west coast of Santa Maria. Or was there something else? And we never did uh, find out until much later. Um, but there, in this place where no turtles laid their nests, they were the first nests in 2014. And even the United Nations who funded the Protected Areas Programme um, in Cabo Verde made a big report and asked them to not go ahead with this breakwater because of the impact it would have, not just on the turtles, but on the ecology of the whole area. Um, but they went ahead with it anyway. So we're kind of losing at this point. Then things started to get a little bit crazier on the beach. The turtle walks that we were doing encouraged other people to do turtle walks and that was great because um, there's, um, you know, we have the, the money should be shared out, but the conservation has to be done as well. You can't just take people to see turtles and forget about helping them or do it in, in any kind of unstructured way. We would, um, we would uh, do a lot of presentations to people to say, uh, to tour guys, to teach them how to do it right. But unfortunately, they didn't really. And it started to get really chaotic on the beaches with, with so many people going there at night, almost worse than having the hunters, actually. Um, and uh, in the hatchery, this is the kind of thing that we were seeing, which was absolutely amazing. I'm sure you'll agree. Very privileged to see this night after night. 
when they come. Sometimes when they come out, it's like a fountain. They're really, really active. But one of the problems was that this happens at night when there's not many people there. And the next day, um, what you would see in the nest when we opened it to count how many had uh, been born and to analyze the contents of the eggs is a lot of shell fragments. So for many people, it seemed as if we were uh, killing all the turtles by moving them to this hatchery, but we didn't care because a lot of people were seeing us at the hatchery and we were making loads of money. And I personally was getting very rich. It was very hard to dissuade people from this line of thinking. There was even a story that goes around, sure, it's probably still going around about me, that I take all the eggs and I sell them to Europe. And a gentleman phoned a phone in once that I was on and said that he had actually seen me at the airport with boxes of turtle eggs and I was selling them to my friends in Europe, which is an interesting one. So at this point, things started to get a little bit difficult for us because people were really aggravated they were aggravated that we were making a lot of noise about all the resorts uh, a development that was going on the West Coast. Aggravated because they thought that we were stealing all the money for turtles by not allowing people to go to um, and take people, tourists on the beach at night, which wasn't what we were doing. And also that we were killing all the hatchlings in the hatchery. Um, and it got so bad that I was physically and verbally abused <laughs> many times, like even having rocks or bottles thrown at my head. And I started to feel, you know, this maybe isn't worth it. But in the long run, who won? Well, remember that little uh, thing that I told you about? This is how it turned out. Yes, it was a beach bar. It was disguised. It was never mentioned. It turned into this really crazy place. It's a very popular place on sale now, very luxurious and so on. But who had the last word? Well, Mother Nature, she doesn't like it. And when there's a big swell, this is what happens. And yeah, the power of the sea. Well, I absolutely love this. It's kind of revenge for me. I hope that they have to keep replacing the beach furniture over and over. Sorry for my vengefulness. And um, in terms of who won, whether the turtles won or not, well, it's actually quite astonishing. This is um, a scientific paper that was published last year, I believe. And here you can see that, look at that. We had uh, so few nests in Sal um, in the first year. And then nine years later in 2017, 7,771 nests. It's absolutely astonishing. And it gets better than that because this year in total, 140,000 nests um, in the whole of Cabo Verde. This starts to really, mean that Cape Verde is a very important place. And on South, 23,000 nests. I can't, I can hardly fathom that many nests. Um, it's quite incredible. Um, the project is now run by Project uh, Biodiversity, who, which was started by a group of people from our project. And they're doing an outstanding job, as you can see. Even with COVID, it's been very difficult for them to, uh, to get international volunteers. But 23,000 nests, I can't believe it. Really amazing. So, turtles have won. So, all in all, was it worth it? It was. It's always worth it to see this. And to see turtles nesting peacefully on the beach with nobody thinking about disturbing them. She's just doing the camouflage that I was talking about earlier. And as you can see, yeah, you don't want to get in the way of that. They really throw a lot of sand around. So, um, was it worth it? We saved that species without a shadow of a doubt. Um, they definitely are not going extinct anytime soon. So that was really great. And I'd just like to end by saying um, that it's a really heartfelt thank you to every single person who ever contributed to our project, employees, volunteers, tourists who made a donation, all of the government people, the military, the police, there's just too many to mention. And to the people who are still doing it, it's absolutely incredible job. Now, for those of you watching, what can you do? Well, the single biggest thing that you can do, in my opinion, is stop eating fish and other marine animals because the fish animals from bycatch to the marine pollution that you can see that really hampers them. So that's what you can do. Or 
if you can, go and volunteer on a project. And I really recommend if you're going to go and volunteer, research well and find a grassroots project, someone that really, really needs you, not a big international conglomerate that's sending volunteers all over the world. For example, on the islands of like Fogo or um, uh, South Ascent and stuff like that, where not so many international um, volunteers go, do something like that. If you want to start your own project, do that as well. You can see you don't need too much experience or um, too much uh, um, expertise. You just need determination. So uh, my final word to you is uh, I'm very interested in helping new projects. If anybody's got a project that they um, would, need, would need a little help on or mentoring or any advice like that, you're really welcome to contact me. I guess you can contact me through the, the festival office. And um, that's the last word. I really hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've got some questions for me. Um, Andre, over to you. Can you hear me, Jackie? No interruptions. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. So, uh, I'm not going to turn on my. I'm not going to turn on my camera because the my internet's not good. Um, but uh, thank you. That was very interesting. I I learned quite a few things yeah. myself as well. Uh, there's yeah. a there's a lot of the background around the around the project that uh, that I often forget or uh, or sometimes I I didn't know as well because I was very isolated with in my in my in my place uh, when I was when I was in Cap Verde. That was that was very interesting. I I I loved how you gave a background to how everything happened and uh, then gave us actual numbers for us to reflect yeah. upon. Um, we have some comments. It's very nice that we have here someone from uh, from another project. Um, I want to say, I, wa I don't want to butcher the, the name here, but it's Risa Latora, I guess. Um, I think which... Yeah, absolutely, from Turtle Foundation, yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's great to see you there. You're right. Yeah, I can see what she writes about the same accusations. It's really frustrating because you really try, you put everything on the line. I mean, I gave up my career, actually. And then um, people think that, you know, I don't know what they think, but um, they often don't appreciate it. So sometimes it's hard. And that's why our turtle conservation community is, is really kind of tight because we all know all of the different things that, um, you know, we have to go through. So, yeah. Great. Um, I can find, yeah. Oh, okay, that's a private message, I think. Maybe I shouldn't uh, read it out. Yeah. Okay. I um I want I want to I want to ask you something, Jackie, because I um I remember I remember tagging the adults. Um, is there is there any sort of tagging that you can use for hatchlings, or is that something that you don't do because they're so small and have a such yeah, a slim chance that's of survival. the problem, and that's one of the things that a lot of people um, who adopted a hatchling would say, "Will my hatchling survive? Can you tag her so that I know?" And I always said. Don't worry, your turtle's going to be the one in 1,000 that survives, I know it. But in actual fact, the biggest problem is that exactly that. If you, you could put um, a teeny tiny tag on them or maybe like a, a, a small microchip or something, but you would waste so much money because so many of them wouldn't survive and that's why it doesn't happen. But I do know that some hatchings have been tagged with, um, uh, you'll know this, Andre, the, those tiny uh, satellite tags that you can put on birds. I do think some hatchings have been tagged with that, not on our project, but um other places as well so yeah all right um about the um, I, I think it's ponte lucino the um, the big structure is that is that currently being built i um, i didn't, I the, didn't quite the night uh, the nightclub thing where the sea is hitting it yeah no i mean the 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 structure that was proved approved in 2014 so that was the year before uh, after i was there the the circular structure that supposedly gives you the safe yeah. swimming yeah, areas. No, they, doesn't. they built that actually um it was one of the key reasons why we decided to leave when we did because i just couldn't bear to see it and they started building it and pretty soon after that we left so that's been up and running for a number of years and it's a very it's a very uh, popular spot and very high end and you can go there all day and have massages and drink as much and have champagne and stuff and I think that people don't realize um, not enough people tell 
to enjoy this. Um, all the time, when we were talking to the government, actually we went, we took a, like a big petition to the, um, the parliament in Santiago to try and get this stopped. And it was clear to me that Sal had become like the sacrifice island, the island that would have mass tourism that would help to fund the economy. And I do understand that, you know, there's a need in countries like this to, um, to generate money, but there was ways to do it. And, and building something like this in a um, protected area was, was just like, it was off the scale, the level of kind of corruption and lack of care for me. I just, I couldn't deal with it anymore. Well, yes, and actually, we've we've we know um, as as a fact now that um, sustainable ecotourism is much more um, is much more focused on local economy and providing for the actual people that live there than these massive uh, tourism uh, locations, which pretty much just fund the the big hotel owners and not even the not even the people that live there because they have temp jobs. Or, uh, or underpaying jobs, which is very different from what you find, for example, with uh, with tourism for with turtle walks, for example, which is a, a very a very profitable business if done correctly, of course. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's okay. You can still see me. I just turned the, the screen share off. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, do, you, do you see the the question here from Fiona? <laughs> Yeah, do you consider paying fishermen to bring injured turtles in? A section on Zanzibar does that. Seems like you don't need to. Yeah, it's a really interesting one that actually. I think that it's um, it's good that you mentioned like the different ways of doing things. And um, it's so, you know, working with the local community, it's it's so different. It's different on Sal than it is on, you know, one of the other islands. So each model, you have to kind of feel, feel your way with it. We did talk about um, paying fishermen for that sort of thing, but actually, once we started to get going, um, we didn't really need to, as you say. And more importantly, was to start bringing fishermen in. For example, we did um, something I didn't mention. There's so many things that I, I can't, don't have time to mention. We did a, an in-water study as well. So we were actually giving the fishermen a kind of plasticized sheet and asking them to tick the number of turtles and the size and the species that they saw each day. So that became um, a, a good way to draw them into our project. Um, and yeah, we found that we didn't really need to pay them. They were quite interested in, in participating. And the hunters on South, it's like, it's a really small minority of people doing this. So it's a big problem and nobody wanted to do anything about it, but it's not like it's really widespread on the island. Good question, thank you. And a message from Armanda saying thank you. Thank you too for watching. Uh, do you have any other questions from anyone? Do you have any questions, Neil? No, <laughs> I don't see any other questions. Um, okay. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Jackie. Thank you so much for taking the time to prepare this. We It's quite obvious that there's a lot of uh, soul in this and this presentation that's why it makes it interesting and so and so grasping to follow um we, we re i really want to appreciate you all for for joining uh thank you thank you especially jackie for preparing this uh like i said before we will uh be presenting this on on youtube uh in a few days not during the event because we are a bit of a in a bit of a hassle here with all the activities going on for those of you who might not know the birdwatching festival that well, uh, it's a um, it's a big event with uh, with over 200 activities uh, going on right now in Sagres in the in Portugal. So feel free to join us uh, this year and the next, where it's a list less complicated mask wise and everything. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you so much again, Jackie, and um, thank you all for watching. And, uh, and I just want... yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just forgot. If anybody wants to get in touch with me uh, privately and chat or anything, or I want any advice, um, we still have a Facebook page, which is Turtle SOS Cabo Verde. So you can definitely message me through there. Okay, that's it. I'm done. Um, yeah, we'll add that information to the email that we sent to the to the people that subscribe to the to the register in the the webinar, and you can you can follow follow that page there and contact Jackie through there then. Thank you all. Okay, thank you.